Michael Hughes is a journalist uh, for the Huffington Post and Examiner.com, as well as an analyst uh, for the New World Strategies Coalition uh, think tank. It is a think tank founded by Afghan natives, uh, which is uh, focusing on bringing peace to Afghanistan. So let's welcome Michael Hughes. And my background, obviously, is in, in more uh, about Afghanistan and Pakistan. But uh, the U.S.-Pakistani relationship, I want to talk about uh, how, it, how it is devastating to Baluchistan. Um, the organization I'm from, just to provide you with some background, because a lot, a lot of the ideas I'm presenting are ideas from Afghan natives, not myself. It's their ideas. Um, and some journalists that have, uh, well, some well-known journalists that have been to Afghanistan. Um, Khalil Nouri founded the New World Strategies Coalition. He is a, uh, he grew up in Kandahar. Uh, he still has deep tribal connections there. His great-grandfather was the governor of Kandahar. His older brother, Hassan Nouri, won the Hoover Medal, Humanitarian Award. Hassan Nouri appeared in front of Congress twice during the mid-90s to warn America about the Taliban. After 9-11, Congressman Ed Royce publicly stated that if we had listened to Hassan Nouri, 9-11 could have been avoided. Two of my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Gould and Paul Fitzgerald, have written two books on Afghanistan, and I reference a lot of their materials in here. Their first book called Invisible History, Noam Chomsky called an important contribution to the uh, history in the region. They also produced a book called Crossing Zero, which is the military's code word for the Duran line, where they investigate U.S.-Pakistani policy. And on the back cover is a blurb, pretty long blurb, from uh, Sig Harrison, giving it a thumbs up. And on the front cover is a quote from Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers. And he calls the book an ironclad oath that depicts America's institutional failure in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You know, we were talking earlier uh, about uh, some of the gentlemen about the tribal, uh, the tribal situation in Afghanistan. Um, for the last 30 years, there's been, uh, last 30 years of war has reduced the country to what we see today, violence, chaos, uh, Islamic extremism. From 1933 to 1973, there were 40 years peace and stability in Afghanistan under King Zahir Shah. There was a tribal structure in place, and the government was not heavily centralized. It was a, a safer society. There was a federalism uh, in place, unique to the Afghans, and they had their own form of democracy. And our organization wants to focus on what worked then, and can we go back to some of those principles. After 30 years of Islamic extremism, uh, the tribal values of the tribal system has been slowly eroded and is turning into a shell of what it once was. Although, you know, tribal values are still key, um, Taliban and the Mujahideen, groups like that, have, and, you know, the communist regime have, uh, you know, devalued, uh, you know, put that secondary to their own ideologies. Um, but ultimately, you can't enforce an ideology onto the Afghan people. Um, there's a quote that uh, it's easier to take an Afghan to hell with kindness than to heaven by force. And uh, I think that's true. Um, but I say they're, you know, from my relationships with the Nuri brothers, I, I say they're hard on the outside, soft on the inside. But um, they're great people, and I'm, I'm proud to work with them. And uh, we, see a lot, we see a lot of similarities uh, between Afghanistan and Balochistan, the plight of these two people. First of all, a very specific common denominator is both are being repressed by Pakistan's military and ISI. And nothing supports that more than the recent WikiLeaks documents. Um, nothing supports that more than the top military officer in the United States calling out the ISI for its ties to the Haqqani network, which actually made news 
which uh, frankly puzzled us because that same story could be published for the last 30 years. They've had a relationship with the Haqqani Network since the 70s. And General Kayani isn't willing to give that, give that relationship up um, because he sees it as an anti-Indian asset. Um, we also have common, a common purpose and we both want true independence. Um, Afghanistan, you know, a lot of the Afghan people don't feel they've been independent in about 30 years. They've had their self-determination undermined by foreign powers. Um, and you know, there seems like a direct correlation between foreign intervention and disaster in Afghan history. They want to protect uh, their moderate Islam values in, the, in their secular tribal code. They want to protect that just, you know, when I heard, when I was reading that about the Baluchistan, the, the secular values and the moderate Islam, that, you know, that is what you know, the Afghans I know aren't Islamic extremists. They're, they're in the minority that are, you know, are the ones that have the guns and the power and are hooked into the network um, that provides them, you know, power, the criminal syndicate, the corruption machine in Afghanistan. You know, Sig Harrison actually uh, pointed out that Pashtunwali, the tribal code of the Afghans, is 5,000 years old, and Islam in Afghanistan is only 1,000. Um, but that was before uh, the Soviets invaded, and there was a, um, the development of the Mujahideen and the you know, Taliban extremism has, has kind of changed that uh, tribal balance. Uh, I found an interesting statement on your website, the Baluch, People have nothing to lose but their chains. And I thought that was pretty powerful. Um, and the shackles that bind are primarily the result of the nexus between Pakistan's military and the double-edged sword of Islamic extremism. However, the US has played a significant role in destabilizing the region as Cold War doctrine still haunts the people of both Afghanistan and Balochistan. America's special relationship with Pakistan has been wholly codependent and dysfunctional. In the midst of a lover's quarrel, the U.S. throws money at Pakistan while Islamabad takes and spends it on everything except what they're supposed to. Both seem to suffer from a relationship of, uh, characterized by can't live with them, can't live without them. The face of oppression to most of Baluchistan is their immediate tormentor, the Pakistani state, for they are the ones committing human rights violations right in front of their eyes on a daily basis, which include kill and dumps, kidnappings, and torture, both direct and via proxy. Now, as Sleek Harris once said, it's a slow genocide. You know, earlier someone had said that. I'm like, you stole my line. You know, I think I've heard it twice. And it is a slow genocide. Um, truth be told, Baluchistan has been treated like a colony ever since Pakistan was spit out of a British laboratory in 1947. More accurately, 1948, when Pakistan forced the incorporation. Partitions were drawn that guaranteed perpetual civil war in the region and the final acts of a defiant and dying British empire. Pakistani journalist Ahmad Rashid says Pakistan inherited a security state from British rule, described by scholars as the vice regal tradition or a permanent state of martial law. As was once said of Prussia, Pakistan is not a country that has an army, but an army that has a country. Today, Islamabad is threatened by Baluchi independence. However, an entire balkanization of Pakistan would be in everyone's best interest, including the Pakistanis. The idea consists of uh, the Afghanistan absorbing uh, the Northwest frontier province and the federal administrated areas which would unite the Pashtun tribes. In addition, the provinces of Balochistan and Sindh would become independent sovereign states, leaving Punjab as a standalone entity. How's that for a modest proposal? <laughs> this is a much more beneficial process for the Pakistanis than, say, implosion, as they rush headlong towards state suicide. If you have any doubt, just look at the current 
foreign policy ratings last summer that came out that ranked Pakistan as the 10th most failed state on planet Earth. If there's any doubt, consider the weak central government, overstretched and incapable of governing Pac Pakistan's frontiers, which has become the number one source of regional and even global instability. Consider that the civilian government is so weak that the true strategic decisions are made by the military, making General Kayani the most powerful man in Pakistan. The governing Punjabi elite have neglected the other three major ethnic groups. The majority of Pakistan's budget is spent on the military rather than economic development, schooling, or infrastructure. Only 2% of Pakistan's GDP, for example, is spent on education. This despite the fact that Pakistan's literacy rate stands at 57%. Meanwhile, only 2% of Pakistanis pay income tax, and much of the country's elite pay zero. As a result, Pakistan's revenue is among the lowest in the world. But Pakistani leaders, they don't seem to care. Because according to the New York Times recently, and I'll read, the Pakistani government appears to have calculated that the country is too strategically important for the United States and the monetary fund. And that even though Pakistan has balked at reforms, the international community would come through with support. However, you know, let's not forget you know, what's behind this. Behind the ISI is, is a story that, that needs to be told. And uh, Elizabeth Gould, Paul Fitzgerald, they, they entitled their book Invisible History. And some of these concepts may be, seem pretty radical. Um, during the Cold War, the U.S. suffered from a Manichaean worldview. They saw other countries in black and white terms, either friend or enemy, commie or non-commie. The U.S. was threatened by anything that resembled nationalism, socialism, and progressive movements. But did, but they did, find common ground with some of the most dangerous Islamic fundamentalists the world has seen. The same Islamic extre extremism that the ISI continually uses as a tool against the peoples of Balochistan, Afghanistan, and India. What is surprising to learn is, you know, certain facts, like some of this began in the 1950s when the U.S. began propagating Islamic extremism through a CIA front in Afghanistan called the Asia Foundation. In the 1970s and 80s, of course, uh, the well-documented cases of the funding of the Mujahideen, as the U.S. practically created with billions of dollars the Pakistani ISI, which was at the time pretty much like a wholly owned subsidiary of the CIA. The ISI trained and funded the Mujahideen to fight the Soviet Jihad, Pakistan's border region. The United States supported General Zia's radicalization of the area, as Zia had his dreams of building an Islamic caliphate and having Pakistani control over the entire region. The number one uh, Mujahideen aligned with the United States, who he gave more money than anyone, gentleman by the name of Gulbuddin Hekmatar. And the US media loved him. He was a CIA favorite. He was the leading, leading recipient of US aid in the 80s. The media ignored her heroin dealing and human rights abuses throughout the 1980s. Dan Rather, not exactly a warmonger, uh, refused to report on Mujahideen atrocities against their own people. And back then there were burning downs of schools, of girls' schools. But that all went underreported under because there was a bigger mission. So part of the point is the US government or our media ignoring human rights violations is not a new phenomenon. Hekmatar himself tried to seize the Afghan capital with the backing of the Pakistani military with no regard for civilian casualties. Pakistani involvement was extremely deep to quote from Crossing Zero, quote, even the CIA became alarmed when in 1990, 700 Pakistani trucks containing 40,000 long-range rockets rumbled from Peshawar towards the outskirts of Kabul for Hekmatar's plan to rain death on the Afghan capital. After the Soviet withdrawal in 1989, 
Um, some say, you know, the U.S. abandoned the region. Uh, I think, you know, that's, you know, arguable either way, but they definitely, you know, discontinued a lot of the funding. Um, in, the, in the meantime, in, in the post, you know, withdrawal, the Mujahideen tore the country apart through a series of civil wars. And Steve Cole's Ghost Wars, he, he does attest to the fact that Afghanistan was out of sight, out of mind. Circa 1990, uh, George H. Bush said to one of his advisors, they're still fighting over there? In the mid-1990s, the ISI helped create the Taliban. And this movement ran roughshod through Afghanistan. Um, one of the interesting stories uh, told to me yesterday by uh, Matthew Ho, who's the director of a Afghanistan study group, who's a captain in Iraq and Afghanistan and a state civilian officer who actually resigned because uh, he's called the war a Pashtun insurgency. Um, and he said he heard stories from people from the tribes that when the Taliban were running through Kandahar and other provinces to take it over, they were promising the people that they'd restore King Zahir Shah. And some governors gave in without fighting, believing them. And that just shows you that um, he's still a powerful symbol. You know, he's, he, he's not around anymore. But uh, a lot of the people are, you know, they're looking for that, you know, that type of leader, that type of uh, tribal life that they had. Um, the, uh, the, ref the Afghan refugees, uh, during the Soviet Jihad, they did a survey of all the Afghan refugees. Do you want a, a Haqqani, Hekmatar type caliphate that Ahmad Ghul, who was the head of the ISI at the time, was trying to organize in a Jalalabad, um, or would you like to bring back the king? And 70% of them wanted to bring, bring back the king. The guy that managed, the, managed that survey was executed by Hekmatar within the next couple weeks. When the uh, Taliban did come to power, um, it's pretty interesting, uh, you know, the Clinton had a policy that was best characterized as ambiguous, with certain people very interested in pipeline deals, certain people willing, even the U.S. government, to, to on the verge of cutting checks. Um, one gentleman, Zal Zalmay Khalil Azad, called the Taliban atrocities the norm. And this was a Pashtun. Um, you know, in the mid-90s uh, is when, you know, Hassan Nouri made this statement. But the Taliban, during the Clinton administration, it wasn't until Madeleine Albright near the end of the administration actually said something. But all those years Clinton was in office, the Taliban atrocities, they weren't so bad. Today, they're unacceptable. And why weren't they then? In the post-9-11 war, um, one thing I should back up, I think everyone, I, I always say it's a given. Obviously, you know, bin Laden was entrenched with the Taliban, and uh, that was an outgrowth of the, of the, whole, um, of the whole movement. Um, and of course, 9-11 you know, you know, did occur. But it was in the post-9-11 post era that the US had an opportunity. They, they really had an opportunity there. The Taliban were wanted uh, for you know, holding, holding Osama bin Laden, who was a terrorist that we wanted to do. Uh, that we wanted to topple, we wanted to bring in, we wanted to kill. Uh, Ahmad Rashid said, the people in Afghanistan were dancing in the streets with their arms open to democracy and their hearts open to freedom. They, they really were looking forward to U.S., what the U.S. was going to bring. And right around then is when we had the great Iraqi diversion. Unfortunately, the U.S., had a skeleton crew, had a watered-down crew, and the Defense Department funded the same warlords that have been destroying the country for years. And once again, these warlords tore the country apart, and we lost, we lost an opportunity there. Zalmay Khalil Azad, uh, this, is in the, uh, this is a fact that's in the U.S. military think tank. They have a magazine. There's an article by Chris Mason and Thomas Johnson. They call the lawyer Jirga that put Ahmed Karzai in place a CIA stage act, where they stiff-armed the king, who was alive at the time, who three-fourths of the delegates voted for, King Zahir Shah, to become the, the leader. They inserted their, their partner, uh, Ahmed Karzai, which was one of the biggest blows 
um, and one of the biggest mistakes they've probably ever made. Today, as was said earlier, today the U.S. policy in Pakistan, and, and that should just give you background on our relationship with Pakistan, how deep it has been, um, and now we're on opposite sides. You know, we, you know, Haqqani used to be our go-to guy because um, he was less, you know, he wasn't as crazy as Heck Matar. You know, it's like <laughs> it's all relative, I guess. Um, and now he's uh, enemy number one. He's the most violent, they say, of the Taliban affiliates. But the uh, United States right now is empowering the Pakistani state and its violent Islamic clientele to commit, a uh, to to commit atrocities against the Baluch with impunity. Money and weapons, billions of dollars of military aid. We've been the enabler. Military aid that is supposedly supposed to root out insurgents in North Waziristan that is being spent on a nuclear program because of an absurd doctrine called strategic depth, which I call strategic depth disorder. A report came out last summer by an arm of the, their very own intelligence unit that concluded that India is not our number one existential threat. For the first time in the history of Pakistan, they were willing to admit that. And using my words, the top existential threat are the monsters from within that they've helped create it throughout the years to terrorize the you know, Indian state. And I, ironically, a lot of them have come back home to terrorize the Pakistani state. And a lot of them are used. You know, a lot of them are assets. Um, but you've noticed there have been attacks on you know, even ISI or military installations. It's, you know, you're playing with fire and uh, now they're wondering why, why they're coming back to haunt them. One thing, um, you know, one common theme through this whole thing, and it's not just the U.S., it's a lot of the, um, you know, European world powers. It's the, you know, the first world powers, what used to be called the first world powers, is, you know, we have our own agendas a lot of the time. This, uh, President Obama has been inconsistent. Uh, continuation of double standards. Uh, supporting one dictator, as you, you were saying earlier, we, we have a habit of supporting oppressors, and we, and we still do to this day, and there's no consistency in who we support and who we don't support. Saudi Arabia has a worse human rights record than Libya, and they're our friends, they're our allies. Based on human track record, you know, someone said Pakistan is worried about Baluchitan is too dangerous, you know, nationalism is dangerous. And sometimes you wonder, you know, if the U.S. has a similar mindset. I think the point is, if you look at what the U.S. has done in the region, think twice about how you want the U.S. to intervene. I think there's a smart way, and then there's, do you really want military intervention? I, I don't think you want that. I think funding, and I think um, the media has to come forward. I think those things are important, but based on the history, do you really want U.S. idea of assistance? You know, obviously they're not going to go fund the Pakistani ISI again, but I think you know what I mean. Is our, our best laid plans can be pretty dangerous. I think that at the end of the day, um, we, the UN does need to investigate war crimes. We need to stop the drone wars. Now I joke around with these, you know, some of my, you know, so-called you know, so liberal friends that are Democrats, and I say, you have a problem with waterboarding, but you don't have a problem with, you know, shooting a suspect based on scant evidence from the sky with no trial. Like, is that American? I, I don't know. You know, it, it seems kind of, you know, the drone program, I think, has fueled the insurgency. It doesn't matter how many mid-level or high-value high targets. Matthew Ho was a captain over in Afghanistan. Yesterday he was telling me it's ridiculous, the percentage of high-value targets that actually get killed. I'm sure a lot of those people that get killed are, you know, they're not innocent. But, you know, a number of civil more civilians get killed than, than is necessary. Um, this drone war, this extrajudicial killing, it's, it's potentially against international law. Um, you know, Obama's this, you know, this constitutional law professor. And, uh, you know, he needs to look in the mirror. I mean, uh, it's pretty amazing what he's willing to authorize. Uh, you know, Obama has, like, tripled the drone program, you know, under Bush. He's tripled it. 
Um, this is a guy that, you know, I don't think anyone imagined he, he'd be doing what he was doing. Um, you know, it, it's kind of scary. And there's something out there that um, uh, my colleagues have brought up in our white paper is that, uh, you know, a few years ago, the, the UN passed the resolution about human rights and the indigenous people. And it's really, you know, it's a principle. It's not necessarily a law, but it's a group of standards that, that we can use. Um, objective standards are always nice, and that Baluchistan can, can leverage. Um, and if the international community, for example, can surround, you know, come forward and say, these are standards that are rights for humanity. They're not rights for Americans. They're not rights for Afghans. They're not, this is humanity's basic rights. Let's all agree on this. Um, that could be a tool. Of course, the U.S. didn't vote for it, but they didn't vote for the international court either, so. Um, sometimes you know, we have our own reasons, but I think you know the bottom line is, uh, you know, we need to think twice. We need to think this through. Um, I think the media has, you know, and me included, has done a horrible job of reporting this. You go on the New York Times and you search for Baluchistan, and there's not an article that's not centered on the Kedeshura. You know, there's nothing about the plight you know, of the Baluchi rebels. Nothing. I, you know, I searched for the last year. That's the New York Times. Um, it's, it's pretty disgusting, you know. And, and I just learned recently, at, you know, uh, about everything that's going on there. And, and I assure you, um, my focus is to change that. My focus is to bring this to light as best I can. Um, the, the, you know, the things I heard today, too, were just, just hard to believe. It's really hard to believe that this was all going on. Um, I st we should stop giving military aid to Pakistan. There's another solution. Um, and I think it's, a, you, know, you know, it's not going to be easy because the, the U.S. <clears throat> is caught up in the, you know, there's history there, and, and they're a little entangled. Um, it's going to be hard. You're not going to decouple Haqqani from Al the Haqqani network from Al-Qaeda. To me, they're one and the same based on everything I've read. And for Obama to try to decouple them and try to say, dismantle Al-Qaeda over here, and then the war's over, um, that's not solving anything. It's just a labeling game. They're all the same people. They sit on, you know, Al-Qaeda sits on some of the shuras, the Haqqani shuras. The, the closest person in the world, uh, you know, let's assume Osama bin Laden's dead. Haqqani's probably the next guy, <laughs> the next most dangerous guy in the world. And um, General Kayani is, you know, is his buddy. And for some reason, for, for, you know, how long have we done this that we think Kayani's going to give him up? It's insane. And plus, you know, he, he does think we're leaving the region. Kayani's not going to give anything up. Um, I was joking around with an Afghan friend. I said, there's a better chance of Kayani converting to Hinduism than, you know, before he gives up Haqqani. So, and I you know, take that to the bank. But, um, but I think, I think our plan has to be focused on, on some of those principles. I think we take ba baby steps uh, would be, you know, and, you know, figuring out where this aid's going, like the, you know, the Kerry Luger bill, you know, do, are we accounting for all that? That's a good idea. But we're talking about one of the most in incompetent governments on earth, you know. Uh, they're borderline bankrupt. They should be bankrupt if it wasn't for us and the Inter International Monetary Fund. They, they would be bankrupt. Um, they lack their civilian leadership, probably worse than their military leadership, you know. Kayani's, you know, walking around with the parrot on his shoulder. He's kind of like a pseudo-hero. Uh, Zardari is a guy, when the historic floods, uh, the biggest disaster to hit Pakistan, and he's off, you know. There's, you know, I, I wrote, I think I wrote something along the line, you know, you could hear the cotter walls of the dying from the Pakistani, you know, floods as Zardari sipped wine you know, with Cameron at the, you know, checkers in, in France. And then he went and stopped by his French, um, you know, his second home in France. You know, and I, and I said, he might as well go on the record and say, let them eat cake. Right. Um, and that's, you know, it's sad that they have that. And I know some good Pakistani people and that are moderate, that they don't, they don't have one person to vote for. They said every politician's crooked or extreme and the ones that are moderate, the, the ones that would perfectly be aligned with a lot of our, a lot of our values, get killed. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And that's, that's the state of Pakistan. That's what we're dealing with, um, an ar artificial state um, that is, you know, it's a remnant of the British Empire uh, that, that we're dealing with here. So it's going to be tough. But um, I think the focus should be on breaking the chains. You know, we've got to focus on, are we, are we going to break the chains because we don't want to tighten them? Thanks. Uh, let me finish with your question after that, because we, we got some more uh, uh, speakers, so maybe we, we leave some time for that one, yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for your uh, great speech and your help and support, and we depend on you guys. You guys are the brain uh, of the humanity. <laughs> Journalists make a big difference, and I hope the Balustan story will get out and will be heard by, by all of us in the near future. Uh, I would like to invite now our next panelist. Um, I request all the rest panelists to try to uh, short their speech as we are running out of time. We hope we will accomplish everything within the remaining time. Uh, let me see if one of our speakers from France uh, is available so he can give a speech quickly over the sky. Uh, his name is Munir Mengel.